we can start. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC314, a course on media and technology. Thanks to each one of you for connecting to the class. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we will get started. Could somebody pray with the class, please? Go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for this hour and moment that we're together to learn more about technology and media, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, God, as we're about to learn what you finish with your wisdom and knowledge, Lord. Lord, we know that everything that we're learning, it's for the time and it's coming to for us to like to share your words through the technologies and through the media works, God. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Ashish. We pray you will through lead him and guide him. And I also pray for my classmates, Lord, that you bless them and help them to grow in wisdom and knowledge. And we really pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for connecting and joining to the class today. So today would be, I think, our, our last lecture uh, for this course. What I'm going to do is, what we are going to do is uh, go through the last lesson, which is on data protection. Uh, just share a few thoughts on it. This will be very short. And then after that, we will um, just do a quick overview of the entire course. We'll go through the whole course content. So the PDF for both of these have, have been put out in the classwork. So we'll just go through the whole PDF. Um, you can have that, keep that as a reference for your future use. And of course, uh, we have to keep in mind that um, everything around us is changing. So the tools, the technologies are always evolving, new things are coming out. So while, uh, you know, we've shared with you whatever is available today and what we're using today, uh, six months down the road, things could be quite different. So it's, you know, it's important to look at what's available out there at that time. Uh, but uh, if at any point down the road you need help, uh, you can always reach out to us and we'll be happy to share with you whatever, you know, whatever we are using, whatever we are learning at that time so that uh, we can help you, uh, you know, to, to, to leverage these things in your uh, ministry, whether you're doing church ministry or some other ministry, we'd be happy to share. So the last uh, lesson we just want to bring our attention to is about data protection, confidentiality, and privacy. So essentially, you know, uh, as we're using these software tools, digital tools, software platforms, etc., uh, one of the main objectives is to manage people's data. Right? So if you have a congregation, several hundred people, of course, the, the, the objective is, okay, I need to keep manage the data. It'll help me in so many ways in uh, engaging with the people. But along with that comes a huge responsibility. And that's, I just want to bring our attention to that. The responsibility is that V, that is as a church or as a ministry, like any other organization, are responsible for the data we collect or the data we, that is given to us uh, by the people who engage with us. So we have to ensure the protection, the confidentiality, and the privacy of that data. And uh, over time, different regions, different countries around the world have understood this importance and they have come out with their own regulations. Now, uh, some countries or some regions are much more strict and some parts of the world, you know, uh, you can get away with a lot of things, but in some parts of the world, you cannot, you have to be very careful. Right. So, you know, this, this whole thing is evolving in various countries and are in different stages of uh, putting regulations in place. So wherever you are operating and now, you know, the fact is uh, many ministries, because we are online, in some sense, we are global. 
we'd be people having people from different parts of the world engaging with us. So we are accountable for the data we collect. Um, perhaps, uh, and I think, uh, you know, what's recognized as the, one of the most toughest and strictest regulations are the regulations put out by the European Union. And you can go to their website, you know, just to get an idea. You don't have to study all of that, but just, just, for, just to be aware that um, they have what is known as the GDPR, the General Data Production Regulation, which is one of the most comprehensive, uh, strictest frameworks out there. And uh, which means that this is how you should handle data collected by people, part of the European Union. But it's a good standard to look at and something that we could, uh, you know, reference and do our best to uh, adhere to. So essentially, uh, they want us to be, you know, whether, whether it's the European Union or whether you're operating North America or any other part of the world, doesn't matter. We have to be accountable to people for the for their data, which they have entrusted to us. Um, and so the, the guidelines put out, uh, the regulations put out there by the European Union GDPR is, is, is a good framework to look at. So basically, what, what does it state? Seven principles. Uh, there's got to be, you got to be fair and transparent when you're collecting uh, the data, how you go about doing it. You know, there's got to, there's nothing secretive, nothing unfair in the way we're collecting people's data. The purpose for which we're going to use the data must be made clear. You know, you're, you're collecting data for this purpose. Okay, you're a church, you're collecting data in order to keep them informed about the activities of the church. Yeah, or, or your, whatever, church or ministry. You're collecting data so that you could, you know, serve them better in these ways. So very clear. Collect only the data you need. Uh, so, you know, it, typically as a church, you don't need the credit card data. You don't need other things. You know, just basically you may need their contact details. You may need their birthday or the anniversary so you can wish them on their birthday and anniversary. That's it. So you collect the data that you need, nothing more, and keep the data up to date. Yeah, so when you collect the data, we're also responsible for keeping it accurate uh, 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 and uh, keep it up to date. So that's part of it. Then storing, storing it uh, only for the duration that you actually need to keep the data. Now, of course, if they are part of your congregation, you would uh, Keep, keep their data with you while they are, you know, you're serving them. Um, they also would may have the option to say, hey, uh, I am I'm moving away from the church or moving out to another part of the world, so you can take me off, or I would still like to be part of the your your database. So that, that those flexibility, that option is there, so that if people don't want to stay there on your in your database, they can leave, and you keep the data only for the purpose and the duration that's needed. Sixth, you also have to do that, make sure that uh, their data is kept confidential, secure. Uh, and, uh, and then number seven, that you uh, are accountable. The organization holds themselves accountable and uh, should be able to demonstrate that they're actually in compliance with these uh, guidance, with this guidance. Right? So those are seven principles of generally this is what we want you to do with people's data this is how you handle process the data right so to sum it up uh, when we collect data which we will be doing when you're running a church management system or uh, something that you're taking administering to people you're collecting the data so it immediately make it's unspoken unsaid that we are responsible for storing their data processing the data in a very secure way we have to protect it from any unauthorized, unlawful, uh, or misuse of their data, and so on. So, for example, you know, as a church, uh, we have intentionally, when we collect our data, we don't give it to anybody else, or we don't use it for uh, other than our own, you know, church ministry purposes. I just give example. So, um, there was somebody in our church who was doing a business uh, and uh, they 
approached us, and this was many years ago, they knew that you know we had our database of all our congregation people. So and then they approached saying, hey, can we, and they had a certain business, uh, can we send an email? Can or can they asked us? Can can the church send an email, uh, sharing what their business, whatever this, with the congregation? We said no, we can't do that. No, we will not be able to give you the data to use it. Neither are we going to you you know send that. That means, hey, this data was given to us by our congregation. You are part of the congregation. You're running a business, but we will not use congregation data for that business purpose, right? So we had to be very clear. And any time, you know, over the years, in the past, whenever people approached us, our response would be no. So now people are very clear, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't even ask uh, that uh, they know the church has data, but we will not use it for those kinds of purposes. Also, uh, sometimes even other Christian ministries would approach us in the past. You know, can you do this? Can you send, you know, promote this thing across to your people? They know we have the database. We not only have database of our congregation, we have database of pastors across our country and even people outside the country. So we have that information. But when they want to, they in the past, they would approach and our answer would be no, sorry, we cannot do it. So even that has gone down. So people don't even ask these days because they know our policy. You know, we're keeping everything confidential and we use it ex exclusively for, because they gave it to APC, they will use it only for APC purposes, not for other business purposes or other kinds of things. Right? Now, in addition to that, uh, we have to be careful who can access the data. Right? So that's also, and I'll just talk, come to that later. But when you talk about data protection, we are, we're saying basically we shouldn't lose this data due to any kind of damage, loss, so on. Of course, for our own organization's benefit. So what do we do? We have daily backups every day. All our software systems are backed up. Right? So it's not once a week, it's every day things are being backed up. There's a backup of everything. Now, of course, because data is, is being updated on a daily basis, right? so uh, there are you know a lot of things happening. So data is being updated on a daily basis. So there are backups on, and and a lot of what we do is on the cloud. So there are backups stored, uh, redundant copies of our data and of all our software that's being stored in the cloud, in. Uh, in, in, in a multi-cloud environment. So that means we're using separate cloud providers. So if at all, and this I, I don't suspect would happen, but you know, if at all there is some disaster in some part of the world, first of all, the cloud providers themselves have a lot of redundancy built into their own uh, service. Secondly, we are doing our own backups in a uh, separate redundant storage so we and which they they also have redundancy in their backups so you know our data is available so if something goes down we can just bring it up uh, from a, a different storage so the data is protected from any kind of damage or potential loss right? if or if there are any virus attacks and so on so uh, we've not suffered any serious, sorry, any serious problems. Uh, we've noticed there have been uh, attempts, uh, but no serious, uh, you know, uh, we've not had any break-ins into our systems or into our data. Secondly, so that's, uh, data protection, making sure the data is not damaged or lost. Secondly, is confidentiality, which means only authorized people should be able to access the data. So, of course, you build this into all our software systems would have the authentication process. That's one thing. Second, we, uh, where, where applicable, we have role-based security. That means you know, if you're an administrator, you can see these things. If you are 
a staff or a consultant, you will see only these things, right? So what you can see, what data you can see will vary depend on how you log in. So I personally would have admin access to all our systems, so I can see everything, but our staff would not have that. They would usually have a, a, a role that's associated with a staff or a consultant. They can see what they need to see. And then what actions can they do, right? So even that is controlled. Uh, similar, it's kind of, you know, you could call it access control or you can call it role-based control. But what they can do with the data is limited to the, is restricted to what they need, depending on what work they are doing. And there are other verifications in place. Typically, we have um, a two-factor authentication set up for wherever it's needed, so that only uh, those who have that can actually log in to the system. So uh, we build confidentially. So you just need to think, all right? So as you are setting up your software system and your various applications for your church or ministry, think about this. I need to protect the data of the that is given to me and make it redundant so that in case of some disaster or some intrusion, I have access to the backed up data. Secondly, I need to make sure it's confidential. Only people who need to should access it. You know, you may have a lot of people serving in your church, but you only need a few people to look at that data depending on what work they are doing. And then the privacy means it's the in in is about the individual. You don't want their name. You don't want their personal details to go out, right? So that's privacy. So uh, you you know you need to make sure that when you are pulling data out for certain use, example, for a promotional campaign, okay, you just need the mobile numbers or you just need the email IDs, you know, but the other details of the person is not sent out to whoever is going to send the email, who is going to send the WhatsApp message or notification. So, you know, typically we would call it de-identified data. That means you've got data, but there's no correlation with who who it is. The it's de-identified. So that way you handle data. So when, especially you know, when you're doing your campaigns, your promotions, the individual's state information is secure, while you're making use of just the piece of information you need to run the campaign, run the promotion, all of those things. So uh, you keep that private, the individual's information. The last point is that uh, many uh, countries and states who have these data privacy, data protection, confidentiality and privacy regulations in place also have something called a security breach notification. That means in case, for some reason, data that you've collected from people has been breached, broken into, somebody has you know, wrongly gained access to it, then you need to notify people. Right? So let them know, hey, this has happened. Uh, we're sorry about it, and this is how we're going to you know, protect you. This is the actions we're taking. So that means if something has happened, Hopefully nothing, it sh shouldn't happen, but in case it happened, then you notify the people, hey, this has happened, uh, this, this is the reason why, and of course you apologize for it, and then immediately you're saying, this is how we are taking care of your data. So that's a security breach notification to the people who have given you their data. So you're being accountable to them. Now, we've not had to do this, but this is a this is a requirement regulation that's in place. Should anything happen, we need to be able to notify people. Okay, so keep these thoughts in mind as you uh, you know as you are working with people's data in your church in your ministry. This is just being accountable to the people for the data they've given and make doing your best to keep their data secure, confidential, private, and uh, being accountable to them right let me pause here before i get into a review of the course let me pause to see if there are any questions on this any thoughts any comments any questions sri kumar go ahead thank, thank you sir um, sir i want to know about um, uh, in case um, if 
is it possible of uh, the, the the church website can be hacked and second thing especially when it comes to the offering part um how we make it more uh, uh, how we say that it's secure the kind of a thing that uh, you know the data is what we are input uh, putting that input uh, the credit card numbers and all how it is secured like how uh, these things are stored in some places or uh, is it uh, how i just want to know about this details sir. thank you mm -hmm. so can so i mean i'm just speaking in general terms and then i'll speak specifically here can any software system be hacked in theory yes right any software system you build uh, can be hacked people are trying to find loopholes to be destructive or be malicious do something you know hurtful harmful um, could things be hacked yes attempts can be made so from that perspective the answer is yeah any software system people may try to attempt to hack into it now for our church website uh, we are using a content management system um, could people try to hack? Try to hack it? Yeah, they can. They've they we've seen attempts in the past, but like you know, we've we've taken whatever like whatever actions I've described. We have taken actions to protect our own websites, multiple websites. Uh, typically, you know, uh, the we use very strong passwords. We use, like we said, two-factor authentication, especially the admin administrative control of the website. And then, of course, they could do other ways, like, uh, you know, uh, through uh, in their attempts to hack, they could, they could try to intrude, especially, you know, in queries that go to the database, they could try to put in their own uh, queries and try to do that. So we've, we've tried to protect as much as possible. And so, so far, we've not had any successful attempt. But in theory, answer to answer to question, in theory, yes, people try to. People could, but we need to keep our defenses up as much as possible. Um, secondly, uh, how you know credit card information? Now we, as a church, we as a church, we don't collect uh, people's credit cards in credit card information. Um, so basically, people make their contributions through direct bank transfer. That is the majority of the people. So that means it comes from their bank to our bank. Uh, some people use uh, uh, the uh, UPI, the payment gateways. So that is, again, in one way, it's going from their app through the bank to our bank account. So there again, we don't collect any information so basically i'm speaking in general terms uh, uh i'm sorry specific for us as a church we don't collect any bank information we don't store any we don't have any bank financial information of our donors nothing um speaking in general terms do organizations store credit card information yeah you can um you you know uh, of course, you do that with the approval of whoever's making the contribution, you know, just to make it easy for them to come back and when they want to make recurring contributions or payments, you can store it. But then, you know, the the final step, authentication, always requires, um, uh, if you're using credit card, CVV, or sometimes you also have another level of authentication, which is the... Um, we you know we call it the OTP that goes to the phone. So you have typically in addition to the credit card, you'll have two other levels of authentication. So uh, that's one thing. And usually the credit card itself is stored in an encrypted form. So nobody from the back end. Of course, you can decrypt it, but generally speaking, a person viewing the database where this is stored will not be able to read that directly because it's in an encrypted form. So to answer your question, uh, now we don't do this because we don't store any financial information, their, their credit card or bank details, but I'm just saying in general, credit card information will always be stored in an encrypted form. So nobody can read it directly. 
then you also have other levels of authentication that are typically typically required to make a transaction success to have a successful transaction on that card which includes the cvv number and also an independent otp number in most cases in india it's strict international it's the otp is not very strict some you, it depends on the settings on the card and banks as well so that that otp is not always there so uh yeah so that's in general terms for us specifically we don't store any credit card information thank you sir thank you very much yeah okay any other questions all right so let's do a quick run through of the entire course uh, just to review uh, you know uh, what we have attempted to cover in this course starting from the beginning all right so of course 314 media and technology we started we started by um, talking about the trends what are, what we are seeing globally um, the fact is that the younger generation and generations that are coming are what we, we would refer to as digital natives they're born you know they've started life with you know the digital all around them and so we said, look, this is something we have to be aware of. We have to, uh, you know, be aware. We need to know what's happening, and we need to be able to relate to these generations that are uh, engaging in this manner. But while we do that, well, we uh, there are benefits, of course, in uh, you know making use of these current tools and methods. Uh, but while we do that. Uh, we have to have some guidelines uh, when we put out these simple guidelines. Stay relevant. Don't compromise the message. Stay pure in your motives, blameless in your conduct, how you use it, and look for lasting fruit, not just something that uh, uh, gets people excited. So then we started looking at various areas of ministry and how that has changed over time. So we talked about how things have changed in the way people minister the word of God. Uh, we, we looked at a couple of examples here. And, uh, you know, in deli delivery style and attire and so on. And the place of preaching. We talked a little bit about the gathering place. You know, there have days where people meet. How that has gone from the temple to the synagogue, to the homes, to the church buildings, to huge, uh, you know, venues today, satellite churches, live streamed churches and so on so that's that's you know it's it's like norm today for many churches to have live stream and people connect and you know and even we are experiencing here in bangalore uh, before the pandemic we used to have maybe 50 60 people live you know watching online now we are more in like 200 plus uh, even after you know all the in person everything has started so we are seeing that even after the pandemic, there's still people watching live. And then there are a lot of people who watch the service afterwards. Then there is uh, worship, how worship has changed over the years, the expression of worship. We kind of did a quick run through of the history of worship. And we talked about the pros and cons of contemporary Christian music and what we should avoid. Uh, the including inclusion of creative arts in Christian ministry. We looked at you know, different forms of creative arts, how we can uh, engage, uh, use it meaningfully. Uh, we see some good uh, uh, you know, work that has been done. And so we should try and encourage that, especially when we are trying to reach people who would relate to those forms of expression. Talk a little bit about print media, how uh, print media is very powerful, enables us to reach people. And we share a little bit about what we are doing as well. 
Then we spent a bit of time on radio, television, films. We looked at the history of radio, how uh, radio was very, has been in the past very effective and in some parts of the world it still continues to be useful. Then we talked about television, how that had a, how that all started and you know how television again was very very powerful medium um, and then slowly people transitioned I mean uh, television then Christian films, Christian films still continue to play a very uh, useful important role, several films that have had a good impact and then people have uh, of course we did mention that people are slowly transitioning from television to online consumption. We made a little mention of uh, entertainment and gaming uh, so this is again interesting of course but it's very expensive so it's not something everybody can do but it's interesting it's useful and it, it provides another way of uh, reaching out to people, engaging with people. Then we transition into digital expressions, so the online expressions, which is very predominant today. A lot of tools, opportunities are available for us, and we should take advantage of them. So we said, okay, you know, uh, it's good for a church or a ministry to think through on the digital engagement strategy. Who are the people you want to reach? How do you want to reach them? And how would you position the work you're doing to serve them well? So think through on it uh, and ask real questions. And just mention some examples of how we could do that. Then we started getting into some specifics. Okay, websites are a very useful, probably even necessary thing to have for church and ministry. And we uh, looked into details on how to get that set up what you can do and basically if you do it well then your your the content you put out on your website will be accessible or visible globally and uh, so we gave some tips on how to do that emails all of us are familiar but just some shared some practical tips on collecting email IDs and how you can interact with your congregation of people through emails then we talked about text text messaging whether you're using SMS or WhatsApp just some uh, tips on how to do it well and um, some examples there virtual meetings all of us are familiar with that we are attending class virtually so that's pretty familiar um, then online content distribution platforms uh, you could distribute ebooks and uh, podcasts and audio video so again these are things we are all familiar with but we'd encourage all of us to make use of these all channels and ways you can reach large numbers of people so to think about distributing your PDFs your audio and your video across multiple channels to reach more people and also having a church app was useful then we got into some guidelines. Okay, how do you do this well? Some learnings that we could share. So we said, you know, when you're working with a media team, it's always good to have some guidelines so that they don't go off and do, you know, weird things. Uh, design graphic design guidelines. Think through on how you want to, you know, um, really the message you want to communicate through your graphics. Think through on that. Similarly, the videos that you create, think through on how you want to communicate the message. So here are all tips that you could use or give to your media team and say, hey, look at these things. Think about these things as you make your graphics and videos. And here are all resources that you can get uh, graphics videos uh, for your use. And some tips on how to optimize the graphics and videos that you create for search engines. Then, yeah, we may say, make sure you, when you're using songs, that you adhere to copyright guidelines, give proper credits. Then we talked about social media, what can be done, some simple tips to use them effectively, and uh, make good use of social media to get the word around 
uh, as you're reaching out to people. Then we got into some boring part, I think. Uh, we started talking about digital equipment, what the software to use when you're doing your graphics, when you're doing your video editing. So there's a lot of paid and free versions as well. You could you know, start off with using the free versions, and then when, when you're ready, you could move into paid software if you'd like. And you know, what are things to keep in mind when you uh, have a media team uh, and uh, just information so that you can engage with them meaningfully. You know, so you're talking about photographs that are being taken, cameras that are being used, uh, just some basic information so that you can talk intelligently with your media team. We also covered uh, our audio equipment. You know, how do you make sure the audio equipment is is um, is is useful in the context in which you're using, working with them? A little schematic of a, a typical audio setup: what you have inside the auditorium, what you use for broadcast, um, and you know the speakers, different kinds of speakers that you typically would have in an auditorium setting. When uh, you know nowadays people use in your mics, in your monitors, so sorry, in your monitors to listen to what's happening, and uh, microphones that they could use, mixers. Cables, just so that you know, uh, this is what's there. And uh, give a sample of, of the audio equipment that we use and the cost. So this is what we are using. But like I said, you don't have to start here. You, you know, we started very simple, very small. And over time, after you know, we've, you know, we're using all of these fancy things, but we didn't start here, we started small. We had some questions about podcasting, so I included this information here. Now, I will come to the question in the chat. Uh, podcasting, you, know, you could use, this is what you could do if you want to set up your own podcast news. And uh, then we went into video production. This is what goes into uh, your video production. You can have a team of people. And these are the things that you typically would need for your video production. We talked about using green screens, making it easy. Is all the typical equipment that you will need for your video production. Live streaming, we shared about you know, the usefulness of live streaming and the typical setup that goes in to have uh, live stream happen. I shared with you the current schematic that we use uh, currently for our live stream, uh, the cameras and all of that, the LED walls, the, mi uh, the mixers and so on. So I've shared that information with you. Um, now, this part I just introduced here uh, for live audio translation interpretation. We, we are not using this yet, but we are exploring uh, doing this so we can actually um, have our services in multiple languages globally. And the last thing that we looked at yesterday was software platforms. Uh, and I just gave you a reference of a lot of free software which we are using for our work. And uh, you're welcome to think about these things and make use of them as and when you are ready. And today was the last lesson on data protection, confidentiality, and privacy. So that's the whole course. Uh, I hope, you know, this, this information was useful. And, um, you know, keep this document with you. And whenever you need, you can come back to it, refer to it, and use it. Right. Let's take some time for questions. Christopher, you have a question? Oh, yes, Pastor. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I think this course has been, uh, you know, has provided a lot of so, so much of uh, information and knowledge uh, about, uh, you know, the extent and, uh, you know, the application of uh, media and technology. So it's been great. Um, I think there are just a couple of points I just wanted to. I guess, uh, you know, just, uh, get your view on. And um, I mean, to the, again, to the sort of objective of, you know, I think something you had mentioned during the end times where, you know, that um, the message of, of God has to reach every corner of the earth. And I think media and technology definitely will be um, a great, uh, you know, infrastructure 
um, and a tool to you know to be able to achieve that objective. So uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, you know, it's great. That, you know, it's been a great course and a lot of lot of information that um, that you have uh, provided. Um, I think that there are just two things I just wanted to mention. One I have to, just, I have to get your view on. One was the um, the ability of media and technology to be able to um, generate um, a debate and uh, you know discussion and um, um, get viewpoints from you know from different sources, whether it is within the, within the church or outside ex externally also. So there are tools that that uh, that allow for that. And um, one of the one of the tools I I mean I, I mean besides of course Twitter which is, uh, is really a messaging tool, uh, Quora which is uh, which does you know sort of generate a lot of a lot of discussions. Uh, you know having some kind of a Quora like uh, uh, platform which uh, just specific, specifically around uh, you know the, the maybe the Bible and even some of the lifestyle aspects of 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 living a. Uh, a Christ-like uh, life. Um, I'm just thinking that you know, is if that if that is possible? Because I don't think that uh, you know churches are doing that, uh, uh, and whether they are actually deploying media and technology to 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 do actually do that. And of course, there would be there would be a need to you know have ground rules which should uh, ensure that these discussions are within certain boundaries, and you know there's not. You know, real uh, aggression and uh, you know um, uh, aggressive behavior, and uh, you know it has to be some kind of a healthy, uh, uh, healthy debate. So that is one. And the second thing is, um, you know, the church being able to um, use media and technology to address, um, um, you know, social issues and social points uh, that are affecting, um, you know, the current times. Uh, so, for example. Uh, in the world right now, there, you know, there's a lot of discussion about you know gender, gender identity. Um, there is uh, you know this topic of woke, um, as well as even the you know the political uh, um, uh, you know uh, some of the uh, le legislation are you know done by by the uh, political system, mm. which can impact uh, the churches. So, good example is um, you know the anti-conversion law. So again, to be able to use media and technology to be able to get um, get some level of uh, consensus as well as uh, discussion around that, and um, thereby uh, you know uh, ensure that you know that uh, people are informed about social uh, topics as well as uh, you know uh, in uh, you know areas which could uh, could impact uh, the, uh, you know the operating of churches. Uh, uh, in a, in a particular country, and um, uh, you know, so I think you know behind this is you know what what is the level of uh, uh, you know um, that that a church can actually uh, you know ensure that you know that that uh, they would they would like to get into those areas. So that I think comes back to you know uh, whether they want to you know be able to and also besides you know all the all the messaging and you know the gospel and uh, lifestyle areas uh, whether they want to be able to get into those areas which which are impacting society right now yeah so i just mm. want to get your view on those points here yeah. mm. mm. um yeah that's um that's uh both are interesting uh comments um let me just respond uh, you know the second one uh, 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 you know the second one uh, is interesting what you said about you know engaging on social issues um which i didn't and i haven't thought of it uh, so and I, I you know i'm not sure exactly how we can but that's an interesting thought so i don't have much to say on it because i really haven't thought thought through on it uh, you know, uh, so on. The first one, which is have more on having discussions and so on, uh, we did try it, but this was our experience. I'm not saying everybody's going to have the same experience, but you know, this was way back, uh, and I'm and I'm thinking I'm going back in time to 2008, maybe something around that time. So, as part of our church website, we had a section for. 
um, uh, people to ask questions and basically the people to interact you know where people could put something similar to Quora the problem was the moment we opened it I think within two weeks there was all kinds of nasty comments and because it's open uh, and uh, it was so bad I had to like on an emergency basis, I had to call our IT team and say, guys, take that down, because people are putting in all kinds of things. It, it was sad. So then we said, look, uh, so that was one problem. And the second problem is we couldn't, you know, uh, we, when people ask questions, ob obviously, uh, we have to moderate it. And the the, the kinds of interactions happening, we, it was almost like a full-time job, you know, <laughs> to sit down and make sure that you know, somebody is moderating this. and responding to those things so it became too much we took it down you know uh, so we did try it and uh, it was uh, you know these were two things that uh, we found very overwhelming one was uh, the the kinds of things that people were writing and to to moderate something uh, it was quite challenging of course then you know we could say let's restrict it but the moment you restrict it then the whole purpose of discussion goes off because then you're restricting it only to maybe a few hundred people and you know you're not opening it to a broader audience so initially we had open to everybody then that's when we saw this uh, more recently this happened when uh, I think earlier this year um, when we had uh, we tried we thought of setting up our own social media platform you know so there's an open source uh, platform called Mastodon when uh, you know when Twitter was taken over by Elon Musk and there are a lot of people moving away from Twitter a lot of them moved to this open platform called Mastodon and basically anybody can set it up so at that point I thought you know maybe we can set up a something for a Christian audience you know uh, and so we actually had it installed uh, the open source version had it installed then I said okay uh, the adoption of it is going to be challenging because you know we've got our people already on Instagram Anjali speaking church people are already on Instagram or Facebook some of them may be on Twitter some of them may be on some other platform and now to tell them hey set up an account in Mastodon this is for church people and you know we can interact you can do things I was like okay I don't want to drive that you know and so anyway it's still running we still have our installation our version of Mastodon we didn't open out in public I just left it as it is but the thought was to create you know an, uh, an a platform like Twitter but this is another version of Twitter for Christian engagement it's still running I mean we haven't opened it out to people uh, but uh, I said okay to drive it and then then the this subsequent things to moderate it you know uh, making sure that uh, because even when you say Christian people are going to put in all kinds of things uh, there, there will be heated arguments and all those things and to moderate it is going to be a lot of work so we actually didn't go public with it so just some you know thoughts and response to what you shared yeah okay so the plan is next week next week Thursday since so this is the end of the course on media and technology uh, so what, what what you can expect now is that sometime next week I'll put up uh, your the assessment uh, it's going to be a non-technical assessment so you know we're not going to ask anything technical uh, we have put out the full course content so you could uh, use that it's going to be an open book uh, everything open assessment so just to kind of walk you through this this thought process and um, and uh, you know you can just do the assessment it's just to give you a grade and also to make sure that you review the course content it's a non-technical assessment so don't don't worry about it the whole idea is just to expose everybody to these things and uh, you know whenever you need it you can go and use it so the assessment will be out please do it take your time to do it now what I was thinking is next week, uh, the third hour on Thursday, we could, if everybody's okay, we can use that to do our course on Revelation and Daniel. Is everybody okay? So next Thursday we'll have three hours of Revelation and Daniel. 
Uh, is that okay? It'll give us, it'll help us finish that. All right. So we'll, we'll do that in case you have some other engagement and you're not a, if, able to attend the third hour. Uh, you can just listen to the recording. But I thought we could use the third hour next Thursday. So we'll have three hours, Revelation Daniel. It will help us, uh, you know, cover that. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this course. Um, and I really appreciate all the interaction. Uh, let's close in prayer and we will dismiss, please. Somebody could pray. Can I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this wonderful day which you have given to us. Lord, we humble ourselves before your throne. And we thank you, Father God, for your wisdom, knowledge, and your grace, which is, Lord Master, which is which is imparted in our life through your man of God, oh, Father God. We pray and we ask you, Father God, let this life be a blessing and blessing for the generations and blessing for the nations, oh, Father. We pray that everything what we have, Lord Master, receive. Lord Master, we pray that, Father, let it be useful for us and useful for your kingdom. We once again thank you for everything, Lord Master. Lord, you led him, you gave him the strength, and you gave him wisdom. You gave him that energy and everything, oh, Father God, to Lord teach us. And we just thank you, Father God, as a blessing, Lord Master, whatever he imparted, oh, Father God. It was really a blessing for us, oh, Lord. Once again, we as a students of Father God, we just thank you for him, and we give you all the glory, honor, and praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you all next week. Enjoy your weekend, and God bless. Bye now. Thank, thank you so thank much, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.